You know, similar to the season of Advent, Lent is a time of reflection and expectation. Lent always keeps Easter in mind as it stands at the end of Lent and draws us towards itself. Like an oasis in the middle of the desert, Lent draws us home. Like a lighthouse in a storm, like the finish line to a grueling race, Easter always tells us in the midst of Lent, this isn't forever. This isn't the final word. At some point, fasting will give way to feasting. This, of course, reveals the central reality of the Christian life, that at the very heart of what it means to be a Christian is to hope, to look towards something in the future, to look out upon the horizon at the eternal Easter of Christ's return when he will come back and make all things new, when he will usher in his eternal feast of the wedding feast of the Lamb. And so Lent is this important season that we dare not skip and yet we don't often enjoy of recognizing that we're in the wilderness and we're looking to something ahead. It's a life of expectation, a life of hope as we await our coming King. And so I thought it would be fitting during this Easter season to remember that the Bible is actually laid out in this dynamic of hope. That from the very beginning of the Holy Scriptures, there is always a pull forward, a pull forward of expectation of something that is coming. And we see all throughout Scripture that pull is an expectation for the coming Messiah. This is what theologians call typology. Typology is just just a Latin word for um, a signet ring. When you put a seal on an envelope, there's a mark, but that mark points to the greater reality, the fullness of the reality of the ring. How many of you have ever read in the Holy Scriptures um, a, a passage in the Old Testament? And you said, wow, that looks an awful lot like Jesus. That looks surprisingly like Jesus. Say you've read the story of Joseph and you see an innocent man who's supposedly killed by his brothers, yet he survives, he resurrects, and then he forgives his brothers and provides for them. Sounds an awful lot like a preparatory story for the death, resurrection, and forgiveness of Christ Jesus. Now, I can't actually think, you know, I think two theologians, well, three, have really done a wonderful job for, have done a wonderful job of, of, of showing how the scripture fits together. St. Augustine, who's really one of the central figures in basically every doctrine. Then, of course, John Calvin. As you all know, I'm always going to give the nod to John. Jonathan Edwards, actually, was one of the key theologians of pointing out how all of scripture fits together. And then the final one is Sally Lloyd-Jones, who wrote the Jesus Storybook Bible. And if many of you have read the Jesus Storybook Bible, you you can see, wow, she has done a beautiful job of fitting the Holy Scriptures together and showing us how all of these Old Testament stories point to the Lord Jesus Christ and his fulfillment. I actually can't think of somebody that's done more for the common church member than her in showing how Christ is woven all throughout Scripture. And so during the season of Lent, I thought it would be appropriate to look at Passages in Genesis that prepare us for the coming king. Passages in Genesis that point us to the Messiah, just as we right now are awaiting Easter, and all of us are awaiting the eternal Easter of our king. So, if you would, let's look back all the way at the beginning, at the very first image and imprint of the coming Savior, Genesis 3. Verse 15, this is what theologians call the proto Evangelion, the first gospel announcement where God pronounces that there will be enmity between the snake and the seed of Eve, her descendant, who we know to be the Lord Jesus Christ. And the snake will bruise his heel, but the very thing that the snake believed would destroy the son of God is the very thing that crushes him because the heel will crush his head. So if you would, turn with me to Genesis 3, and we're going to look at Genesis 3, verses 1 through 15, to kind of see the scope of this passage. 
Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field and the Lord God, that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die for God knows that when you eat of this, of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. As I said, in verse 15, we see what is called the Proto-Euangelion or the first gospel. Not in the sense that there are two gospels, you know, a first one and then a later one, but in the sense of the first announcement of the gospel. Because we see here this in, in, in a shadowy sense, this great conflict that would ensue, a conflict between the serpent and God's people, the seed of Eve. And yet that conflict will not end in God's people's destruction. Rather, Eve will have a child who will have a child who have a child who have a child. And that child, while he will be bruised, while his heel will be pricked by the fangs of the serpent, he will ultimately crush the head of this great enemy. Now, the word bruise here, it's kind of a wimpy word, isn't it? Like you bruise your hip when you bump against a table, right? And as we can see, if we're thinking about this in terms of this, the death of Christ, he was far more than bruised. He was pierced for our transgressions. And not only that, but we need the serpent to be a lot, lot more than saying, oh, I have a lump on my head. We need his head utterly crushed. And so we need to understand that in the lexical range of this Hebrew word for bruise, that for some reason, I've never known why translators use it this way. It actually means crushed. It means to utterly destroy. And not only that, but you might also know that there's theological traditions that say the seed of Eve or Eve herself will bruise the head. That was actually a bad Latin translation by Jerome. It is not Mary who will crush the head of the serpent. It's the seed of Mary, Jesus Christ himself. And so we see here in the earliest church has seen it from the very beginning of God's people that this is an image, the very first image of the gospel pronouncement that while sin entered into the world, sin will not have the final word. And there will be one who represents all of God's people to go against the serpent and defeat him. Now, before we go any further, I think we ought to ask a few questions in the text. And the very first one is, who on earth is this serpent? Now, many of us are going to jump ahead and say, the devil, the Satan, the tempter. And you wouldn't be wrong, but let's not go there too fast. Let's, let's do some careful theologizing together. Because when God created, what did he create? Did he create everything as good except for serpents? Did he say, everything I made is great and good, but not that thing. No, 
Rather, everything he made, including serpents who had a job of you know, controlling pests, even though we don't really know what that means before there's death. Okay, leave that aside. Even serpents are good. But what we see here is a serpent who's not good. A serpent who has fallen before what we would call the fall. The fall happens when Adam and Eve rebel against God. And yet there is a creature who prior to this fall has already bent his heart away from God and has come into the garden with a purpose to bring about destruction for God's people. This is why Martin Luther in his brilliant commentary on Genesis said this, let us therefore establish in the first place that the serpent is a real serpent. He's not merely, you know, like, uh, you know, the image of a serpent. It's a, it's a real serpent, but one that has been entered and taken over by Satan. We don't know exactly who this serpent is in, a, in you know, a really objective sense, but it appears to the best of my theological capacity that, that Martin Luther is right that this serpent is actually the first instance of a demonic possession. That there is something outside of God's good creation as we know it, some prior understanding of creation that we aren't given a firm window into. There are hints at the demonic in the scripture. There are hints at the angelic in the scripture, but that's not our story. We don't have a clear window into that. But what we see here is that there is a snake that appears to be possessed by something outside of God's good creation that is bent on its destruction. From the beginning, there is an enemy of God's people. Now we see this clarified, interestingly enough, at the bookend of scripture in Revelation. In Revelation 12 and 20, Revelation 12, 9 says, and the great dragon was thrown down that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Now, Revelation 20, two verses three. And he seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who was the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. So what do we see here? The end of scripture casts light on the beginning of scripture. That clearly this serpent is who we would call the Satan or the deceiver or the tempter, or the devil. This is one who would later grow because he's not merely tempting two people anymore, Adam and Eve. He's grown to the size of a dragon because he's deceiving and tempting the entire nations, the whole world. Now we don't, again, know exactly who this person is. There are theologies that make too little of him, and we'll get into that in a moment in theologies that make far too much of him. But what we see is at the very beginning of humanity, there is an enemy bent upon the destruction of God's people. Now let's go back to the garden for a minute. So often our theologies, we ask the question, how did the fall happen? What led to the fall? And one of my favorite thinkers, I don't know if we should call him a theologian, but I don't know if we shouldn't call him a theologian, is C.S. Lewis. And Lewis talked about free will. Free will led to the fall. That the only way for God to make a creature that can truly love him is if he makes a creature that is truly free. And we actually do believe the human will was free prior to the fall. But Lewis's argument doesn't add up in my opinion. And many, many, many theologians. Because one, it's not actually what the scriptures teach. A perfectly free will would be perfectly unstained by sin and therefore a will that would only choose the good. It's a will that is not bent towards rebellion, a, bill, a, a will that is, is not bent towards doing what it wants over what God wants. Rather, what we see in the scriptural narrative is that there is a pre-fallen will that has infiltrated the garden and has deceived God's people and led 
God's people into rebellion. And yes, that rebellion they are responsible for. Yes, you and I are responsible for the ways that we receive the deception of the tempter. And yet when we look at the very beginning, what do we see? There is an enemy that is tempting, guiding God's people to destruction. And what does that destruction look like? What does he lead them into? What does he tempt them with? He leads them into guilt and shame. Now, I'm not talking about guilt and shame in this like modern way. We're always talking about guilt and shame and those are inherently bad um, because sometimes you need to have guilt and you need to have shame and our current society is showing us how, how terrible it is when we untether ourselves from that. What he actually leads them into is being guilty and being shameful because what, what has Adam and Eve done? They've rebelled against God they have had now God's judgment is upon them. And then they run from God and try to hide by clothing their shame and hiding their shame. What are the twin fangs of this serpent? Guilt and shame, which leads to alienation and hiding, a running from the one who is life himself. Why is it that sin is death? because sin leads to this guilt and shame that causes God's people to run and hide from the source of life himself. And this great enemy has been at work to compound guilt and shame in God's people, which leads to ever increasing alienation. And my experience is we often don't think about it in terms of the devil. The ancient church, the church, has always talked about the fall in this Christian life of conflict that we have by the three great enemies that we have. The flesh, which we do believe our flesh has fallen. We believe that our hearts are now turned inward and turned away from God. Much of our sin is guided by our sinful hearts. That's what theologians called the flesh. Sin which is this judgment that we have that compounds judgment, that sin multiplies, that as we look at the law, we see that we don't meet the law and that actually leads us into further sin outside of grace. But then we finally have another enemy called the devil. And my experience is, especially we reformed Christians, because we are so afraid of diminishing the objective work of Christ Jesus, we diminish the reality of the real enemy that we have. Do you believe that you have an enemy in your life? Do you believe that the devil is bent upon driving a wedge in your family and in your marriage? And he will be incredibly creative in how he does that. Do you have eyes to see that? Do you have a radar to detect that? Do you even have categories to talk about it? Do you believe that the devil is at work to stir up anger and resentment in your heart through the social media that you consume and the news media that you consume? Because often, increasingly, this is what our major news media outlets are entirely predicated upon, building resentment in you so that you go to them because you distrust the other? Do you believe that there is actually a force behind that to distort your heart? Do you believe that the devil is at work to drive you to increasing despair and hiding in shame through the addiction in your heart that you're afraid to admit is there? Do you believe that? Do you believe that the demonic is at work in our world to stir up war and strife and racism and classism to drive us against one another? Do you believe that we have an enemy? Because what we see in the Holy Scriptures is from the very beginning, there is a tempter, there is a distorter, there is one who is bent upon the destruction of God's people. But, but from the very beginning, there is also a promise given that the tempter 
the perverter, the destroyer does not win. Look back at our passage because we need eyes to see the work of the devil, but we also don't need to give him more than his due. So often I think charismatic theology unintentionally while trying to open people's eyes to the reality of demonic conflict in the world makes you tacitly believe the devil might win. And there's a promise given in Genesis 3.15. He doesn't. Look at Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you and the woman. Look at that promise. There's going to be conflict. There is going to be conflict. And between your offspring and her offspring, but he shall bruise your head. Remember, crush your head and you will bruise or crush his heel. Here we see that the victory of Christ in this incredible image that a poisonous serpent, right? It just needs to prick your heel to kill you. Its venom can get all the way into you if it bites you anywhere. What we see later is it's foreshadowed in this passage, but that is a death blow. And yet it is precisely through that death that the victory is won. It is precisely where the devil strikes that it is, it is his own undoing. It is the very pit that he digs that he falls into and God buries him. What we see here is the promise given that the seed, Christ Jesus himself, will have the final victory. And what does he have the final victory over? How does he actually win his victory? By taking the twin fangs of the serpent, guilt and shame. And he takes all of that upon himself. He places it upon a cross. He buries it in a tomb to crush the head of the one who seeks to continue to drive you to guilt and shame. And I can't think of a more beautiful passage that clearly brings us back to the garden and undoes everything the serpent does. Then 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 21. Turn with me there. One of my favorite passages in all the scripture. If you've been at Trinity for these past eight years, you've known we've come back to this passage again and again because it jams so much of our theology into one place. Look there with me. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Remember, flesh that revelation is shame. We don't regard people that way anymore. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. We get to go back to the garden before the fall, before the tempter. They are a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to him and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What do we see here? The undoing of everything the devil did. There is a new creation, not characterized by flesh, not characterized by shame. What did shame do? Shame drove Adam and Eve into hiding. And what is the theme we see here? God collecting his people back to himself, pulling us out of hiding, pulling us out of the bushes, pulling us out of this great fear that we have as he brings himself to us. Not only that, but we see in Genesis 3.20, what do we see in Genesis 3.20? The second gospel proclamation. Because what does God immediately do with Adam and Eve? The very first animal dies. For what purpose? 
to clothe their shame. To clothe their shame. And then what do we see all throughout the Old Testament? A sacrificial lamb is given. That sacrificial lamb is made to be sin, to cover over and clothe the shame of Israel. And what do we see in 1 Corinthians 5? Or 2 Corinthians 5. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. That is a clear statement about the sacrificial lamb of the Old Testament. You can't, that is, that is a fact. That's what he's talking about. So that we might become the righteousness of God. At the very beginning of Holy Scriptures, God goes about the business of collecting his shameful people back and saying, I'm going to cover over your shame. And he does that all throughout the Old Testament by covering over their shame with the sacrificial animal of, of the scapegoat of the sacrificial lamb. And he does it most of all with his son who covers over our shame with his very blood. The one who knew no sin is made sin to take our sin as far away from us as the East is from the West. What do we see here? The twin fangs of the serpent have been ripped out because our guilt is hung upon a tree in Christ Jesus in our place. Our shame is covered over as we are made what? The righteousness of God by the one who is perfectly righteous. What we see here is that Christ Jesus has won his victory by swallowing up guilt, shame, and death upon the hard wood of the cross. And this itself is why we celebrate. We have it. It's okay, Jeremy, don't worry. The gift of our Lord. But here's the thing I want to just remind you of just for a minute. If you are in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation for you. The head of the serpent has been destroyed. He has been crushed. You have been healed. And yet, if you've been alive for 10 seconds, you know he's still busy. He's still at work. He still is in these death throes of trying to wrangle God's people back into death. There is, like I said, this danger of putting a demon under every rock that can, in our hearts, confuse us into thinking we could be lost. And the Holy Scriptures from Genesis 3.15 says you can't. You can't. Jesus has won for you. You are secure. The sickness that leads to death has been healed. But now, it's, think about it like this. The devil is like a virus that seeks to sap your life away. There are still works that he does that pull your heart away from the source of life, that sap your life away like a common cold does. And so often, we don't want to look at those viruses we don't want to look at those places where the devil is still sapping our life away because we know it's going to be painful for the great physician to administer his medicine. And so I want to give you that word of encouragement. You are secure, and yet there is still an existential reality that the great physician, our great healer, the Holy Spirit, still wants to apply his medicine to the places where where. The devil is still tormenting you in some way, still sapping you of life that God has given you, still robbing you of the fullness of what God has offered. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I still want you to be absolutely encouraged by Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. What do we see there? Yes, Christ is ultimately one. Yes, we experience 
the torments of the devil still in our lives, but there will come a day, a day where you will not know any sin. You will not know what it means to have your heart torn in two directions. You will for once know what it means to have a completely pure heart and will one thing and one alone, the glory of God and the prospering of his kingdom. Can you imagine what that will be like to not be plagued by sin anymore? To not have those viruses that we still need the spirit to heal? To have a perfectly pure heart? Family, Christ has won the victory. He is winning the victory. But finally, one day, he will finally consummate the, his victory and there will be no more pain, no more grief, no more death. And we need to have our eyes fixed upon that day, longing for that day, and to have that day break into today where Christ progressively conquers the devil in your life. And so today I just have three questions. First, do you believe you have an enemy? Or do you believe he's just a garden variety snake? Have you so elevated the objective work of Christ, which you have heard me preach to you over and over again, that you've forgotten that there actually is an enemy in your life? Do you have eyes to see it? Have you and your friends or your spouse or your children prayed about how the devil might be at work in your family? in your workplace, in your world? Do you have eyes to see? And second, do you have the courage to ask the Holy Spirit to bring his healing medicine? Because if any of you have ever experienced healing, you know it feels like God unwrapping a serpent from you, and it is incredibly painful as he does it. But if you've ever experienced the freedom on the backside, you know that that pain is worth it. Go to the one who can heal you because he does promise to take that serpent away and to give you life. And then finally, do you have eyes and hope for the day in which there will be no more temptation? There will be no more pain. You will be fully yourself. Family, that's the promise that is given. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have defeated the serpent, that you will continue to pull him out of our lives by your Holy Spirit. Lord, would you give us a hunger for the freedom that only you can give? Would you give us a humility to seek the one that can actually give us freedom. Lord, you don't call us to do it ourselves. We can't do it ourselves. It can only be a work that you do. Lord, would you give us freedom? And would you set our eyes upon that day where you will finally come back and make all things new? To the glory of your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.